Please open your Bibles to 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter 19. 1 Chronicles chapter 19. Read along with me. Now it came about after this that Nahash, the king of the sons of Ammon, died, and his son became king in his place. Then David said, I will show kindness to Hanan, the son of Nahash, because his father showed kindness to me. So David sent messengers to console him concerning his father. And David's servants came into the land of the sons of Ammon to Hanan to console him. But the princes of the sons of Ammon said to Hanan, do you think that David is honoring your father and that he has sent comforters to you? Have not his servants come to you to search and to overthrow and to spy out the land? So Hanan took David's servants and shaved them and cut off their garments in the middle as far as their hips and sent them away. Then certain persons went and told David about the men and he sent to meet them for the men were greatly humiliated. And the king said, stay at Jericho until your beards grow and then return. When the sons of Ammon say that they, uh, saw that they had made themselves odious to David, Hanan and the sons of Ammon sent a thousand talents of silver to hire for themselves chariots and horsemen from Mesop uh, Mesopotamia, from Aram Makkah, and from Zobah. So they hired for themselves 32,000 chariots and the king of Makkah and his people who came and camped before Mediba. And the sons of Ammon gathered together from their cities and came to battle. When David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the army, the mighty men. The sons of Ammon came out and drew up in battle array at the entrance of the city, and the kings who had come were by themselves in the field. Now when Joab saw that the battle was set against him in front and in the rear, he selected from all the choice men of Israel, and they arrayed themselves against the Arameans. But the remainders of the people he placed in the hand of Abishai, his brother, and they arrayed themselves against the sons of Ammon. He said, if the Arameans are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the sons of Ammon are too strong for you, then I will help you. Be strong and let us show ourselves courageous for the sake of our people and for the cities of our God, and may the Lord do what is good in his sight. So Joab and the people who were with him drew near to the battle against the Arameans, and they fled before him. When the sons of Ammon saw that the Arameans fled, they also fled before Abshai, his brother, and entered the city. Then Joab came to Jerusalem. When the Arameans saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they sent messengers and brought out the Arameans who were beyond the river, with Shopach, the commander of the army of Hadadezer, leading them. When it was told David, he gathered all Israel together and crossed the Jordan and came upon them and drew up in formation against them. And when David drew up in battle array against the Arameans, they fought against him. The Arameans fled before Israel and David killed of the Arameans 7,000 charioteers and 40,000 foot soldiers and put to death Shopach and the commander of the army. So when the servants of Hadadezer saw that they were defeated by Israel, they made peace with David and served him. Thus the Arameans were not willing to help the sons of Ammon anymore. Then it happened in the spring at the time when kings go out to battle that Joab led out the army and ravaged the land of the sons of Ammon and came and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem and Joab struck Rabbah and overthrew it. David took the crown of their king from his head and he found it to weigh a talent of gold, and there was a precious stone in it, and it was placed on David's head, and he brought out the spoil of the city, a very great amount. He brought out the people who were in it, and cut them with saws, and with sharp instruments, and with axes, and thus David did to all the cities of the sons of Ammon, then to David, and all the people returned to Jerusalem. Well, if you're not lost, you know, if you haven't lost the story and the strange names that we're not used to, basically this is what happened. When David was on the run from Saul, he received help from Nahash, who was Hanan's father. They joined together against Saul's forces. When Nahash died, David tried to form an alliance with his son, Hanan, as a favor, because he was much stronger. Hanan and his advisors were suspicious of David's intentions because there was a time when these two nations were actually at war in the past. 
So what they did was they humiliated the ambassadors. They made them return without pants and they shaved their beards as a way of rejecting the offer of peace and alliance with David. Once they realized the extent of their offense, Hanan and his advisors prepared for war by hiring mercenaries from surrounding nations in order to fight the Israelites. The rest of the story describes how David destroyed these people in three separate phases. Phase one, Joab, David's chief military commander, defeated the Ammonites, uh, the Ammonite army and local mercenary forces in an initial battle. Stage two, David himself leads the troops against Hadadezer, a more powerful Aramean king brought in by Hanan. And then stage three, the final stage, actually came in the springtime. The war stopped because of winter. Interestingly, it was during this spring campaign while Joab was making a final attack on Hanan's capital city that David has had his affair with Bathsheba. So Joab did defeat the city and David went to remove the crown of Hanan and place the people into slavery. He even made them tear the walls down of their own houses and fortresses. The way it reads sometimes you might think that he sawed the people in two, but that's not the case. The, he made the people tear down their own homes and tear down their fortifications and so on and so forth. Now from David's perspective, this story is a good historical account of how David and Joab and the military uh, carried out diplomacy and war some 2,700 years ago. But from Hanan's perspective, and that's my lesson tonight, from his perspective, it teaches us a valuable lesson on the dangers that result from having a suspicious mind, which is what he had. Sorry to all you Elvis fans who thought I was going to preach on Elvis tonight. It would have greatly helped Hanan if he knew the difference between suspicion and caution. I repeat it, if he would have known the difference between suspicion and caution. Suspicion is based on feelings. Suspicion is based on intuition. It is subjective in nature. It is an impression based on external signals mixed with our preconceived ideas and character. For example, Hanan was a, 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 a pagan. He was insecure. He was new to his job as king, knowing that the Israelites had one, once, been enemy, once been enemies. David's offer through these eyes was seen as suspicious, was seen as, as a threat. Caution, on the other hand, is based on fact. It's based on communication. Not what we feel about something, but what we know to be true because of knowledge, usually through investigation or communication. For example, Hanan could have reserved judgment until he had direct communication with David. What kind of peace do you want to make? What kind of treaty? What are the terms? Well, you know, if he would have investigated a little further, he might have gotten some important information. And he could have made a treaty that at the same time uh, made an alliance with a powerful country and also protected his own interests. That would have been cautious. The Bible says that caution or prudence seeks knowledge and avoids needless battles. Proverbs 13 verse 16 and chapter 22 verse 3, same ideas. Caution has a, a kind of a go slow approach. It reserves the decision or the judgment until enough facts can be, can be gathered. Suspicion goes by feeling and usually wants to believe the worst. You ever notice that people never suspect the best? They always suspect the worst because finding the best requires that you investigate. Suspecting the worst, you can go on a feeling or, or an idea. So Hanan's, his suspicious mind, he was obviously a very suspicious man and his attitude and actions provide important lessons for us today because many of us struggle with the problem of having a suspicious mind. And I'm not saying you have a suspicious mind for 70 years in a row. I'm just saying there are times in our lives you know, when we, you know, we're not as trusting as we normally are. We're suspicious of things around us and usually that gets us into trouble. So the first thing I want to say about Hanan, <coughs> excuse me, 
<coughs> and his suspicious mind is that it led him to trouble. He found out that groundless suspicion often leads to trouble. He let other people feed his suspicious mind with false information. You know, if you're suspicious by nature, then everyone and everything seems to have evil motives. This kind of attitude doesn't allow for the building of relationships with people because you're always feeling that, you know, you're always feeling and suspecting the worst about them. How can you draw close to someone? How can you build a relationship with someone if your nature is suspicious? You're always suspecting the worst from them. Suspiciousness will cause us to make rash and unfair judgments and decisions that we are likely to regret in the long term. Another problem that Hanan had is he covered one mistake with another mistake. A suspicious mind often leads us to make mistaken judgments and then pride will lead us to try to cover that mistake with more bad judgments. You know, Hanan made a dreadful mistake in judgment and then he made a deadly move in humiliating David's emissaries. So instead of acknowledging the mistake and making an attempt at an apology and reconciliation, he chose to multiply his errors by going to war. You know, I've seen this happen you know, when people make a bad decision and then they try to cover it up. Young people, unmarried people, young people get together, they go too far sexually and uh, the young woman conceives a child and they're not married. They may, even only be casual, they may only be casual friends, but they allow themselves to go too far. And a baby is in the way. And so how do they fix that? Well, they make another mistake. The girl decides that she's going to have an abortion. Wow, there's one mistake done, and then a bigger mistake is made in order to cover the first one. Or two friends argue, and they begin to tear each other down to others in an effort to show that they were right. And what's the result? The ruination of a, a long-term friendship is destroyed. You know, two wrongs certainly don't make a right, but suspicious people have a hard time with this concept because their basic problem is that they believe that they are always right and anyone else who disagrees with them immediately becomes suspect. <laughs> sure, if you have a suspicious mind, the way you justify it is by assuming that, well, you're always right. Of course my assumptions are right. And unfortunately, before a fall comes what? Yeah, it comes pride. Before a fall comes pride. And then another point about Hanan, when you're wrong, no amount of power will make you right. Hanan made a foolish decision because he was naturally suspicious. And when it came, became evident that this was a fatal choice, he tried to use force to confirm his convictions. You know, the Bible tells us that he lost the war, he lost his nation, and he lost his own personal freedom, and he lost his crown. You know, the philosopher, humanistic philosopher Nietzsche he proposed the idea that the most powerful people should be the ones to make the rules and establish what is right and wrong in society. This is morality by force, you know, might makes right. But what is essentially right, what is essentially good and proper has been established by God already from the very beginning of time. And no human power or might is able to change what is basically right or wrong. You know, to lie or to steal is wrong, no matter what. No matter how big your army is or powerful you are, if you use that army to kill and steal, it's still killing and stealing, it's still wrong. Even if Hanan had won the war against David, he still would have been wrong and would have had to answer eventually to God. So how do you deal with suspicion. How do you deal with this issue? We all go through it from time to time. The story here is ancient. 
But the problems and the lessons are contemporary and they're relative to our experience in the 21st century. How can we avoid Hanan's mistakes and neutralize our own suspicious na uh, uh, natures? Well, first of all, I would say to you, check it out. Whatever it is, check it out. Solomon says that a prudent man acts with knowledge. Proverbs 13, 16. A prudent man acts with knowledge. If you're not sure, if your intuition sends out warnings, then check it out so you can base your feelings on facts and not simply your facts on your feelings. Easy to say. Easy to say. Base your feelings on facts not your facts on your feelings. You get into a lot less trouble that way. Knowing the facts, taking the time to know will help avoid jumping to hasty conclusions about anything. Number two, take people as they are. Not everyone is like us. Not everyone lives up to our criteria of the perfect person. We should allow people to be themselves, allow situations to explain themselves until proven otherwise. We save ourselves and others a lot of pain and trouble if we avoid second guessing everybody else's motives. <coughs> it's one thing to judge somebody's, somebody's actions because you can see those actions. But to not see any actions and judge their motives means that you are able to read their heart. Who gave you that power? Did God give you that power? Because He didn't give it to the rest of us. And then finally, trust God. Don't be afraid, go ahead and trust Him. The essential difference between Hanan and David was not military or culture, it was faith. David trusted God to protect and to guide him in his affairs. Hanan trusted human advisors and his own suspicious mind. Suspicion is a sign of fear and insecurity. Faith in God is the greatest antidote to these things and the only way to calm a suspicious, a suspicious mind. And so suspicious minds can lead us to make bad decisions about people, a suspicious mind can keep us isolated and perpetually stuck in the vicious cycle of fear and insecurity. When you make a mistake or you hurt someone because of this weakness, I encourage you, apologize and acknowledge the reasons why you did what you did. It's okay to say, you know what, I jumped to conclusion. That was my mistake. I assumed. I suspected, and there, there were no real reasons for me to suspect you of doing this or saying this. And I apologize because I assumed things that were not even true for which I had no proof. It's okay, I've had to say that to people. Also, I would encourage you to cut your losses and make things right as soon as you can. Don't bluff and make it worse which is what Hanan did. Made a bad political decision and then followed that up with a war, which cost him everything. If you're looking for a change of heart in this area, replace suspicious with caution. This is the true and biblical virtue perverted into suspiciousness by fear and poor self-worth. Also, be more accepting and forgiving of people as they are, and you will see that others will begin treating you in exactly the same way. And have more faith in God to protect your life, to protect your interests. You know, we, we believe that God will protect our lives, but He'll also protect our interests as well, if we ask Him to. Trust Him to help you discern what and who is good or what and who is evil. What is a good deal and what isn't a good deal. It's okay to pray and ask for wisdom before you buy a vehicle or before you, you know, enter into a contract to purchase a home, before you sign up for this or take this job or take that job or whatever. 
God encourages us to come to Him and to lay these things before Him that He might help us. That's what the cautious man or woman does. You know, it's a good thing that God is not suspicious or accusatory because He'd have plenty to be suspicious about concerning our lives and our sins. Thankfully, God has complete knowledge of us. He has complete knowledge of what we say and what we do. There's no need on His part to suspect us. He knows us and more importantly is quite willing to accept all those who come to Him repenting of their sins and accepting baptism in order to receive forgiveness. Unlike Hanan, I ask you and encourage you not to be suspicious of the offer of peace that God lays before you each week as we gather together. Don't be suspicious of your brothers and sisters without, without cause. Ask God to give you wisdom and insight to understand them and to understand every situation where you have to make important decisions. If you need a new start, if you need a second chance, the Lord is offering that to you this very moment as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.